Hi, everybody. Welcome to Topic 3 of Unit 1. We're talking today about the political dimensions of sporting organizations. You may notice from the syllabus or from the general overview of Unit 1 that we're also going to have a lecture on the sporting dimension of political organizations so we can see sort of the, the two sides of the equation and who plays into these sports and politics sorts of things. Today we're looking at really the sporting organizations themselves. We looked in the first two topics of Unit 1 about how countries recognize each other and uh, how the sports might play into that with different sub-states or aspirant states or micronations and the like. Today we want to look at how they interact within the sporting organizations themselves. And to accomplish part of that, I would like to introduce you to uh, a concept, maybe it's introducing, maybe you already know, about uh, non-governmental organizations. So we'll talk about NGOs today and IGOs in a couple of lectures here in, in Unit 5. These are entities, NGOs are entities to which governments do not formally belong. This does not stop them from having partnerships with these organizations. For example, you will be familiar with the International Committee of the Red Cross, the American Red Cross, and perhaps even local or regional organizations like the American Red Cross of Greater Idaho. Governments often partner with them either to set up sort of informal channels of aid money, so the United States government in uh, say in the week of Hurricane Katrina may suggest to Americans that they donate to the American Red Cross or to the ICRC but they're not formally there like if you go to the American Red Cross offices you may you'll find Americans working there but you won't find the American government working there you won't find a government agent making decisions channeling funds etc formally making decisions on behalf of the organization there are tons of these many many thousands of these around the world so an NGO can be dedicated to anything of any size at the local regional state national, international level, doesn't matter. Uh, they just have to have a focus and be basically nonprofit and dedicated to helping uh, helping achieve a cause that they lay out. The bottom four here are all organizations that were recognized here at the Martin Institute at the University of Idaho for their distinctive work here from the Northwest for people internationally. So the International Rescue Committee in Boise helps resettle refugees from abroad into, uh, into Idaho. Uh, Child Aid is based in Portland and they work on uh, on education and uh, critical thinking skill, uh, imparting that in Guatemala. Agros International is a, a, a land sharing and education, uh, agricultural education entity also based in, in Portland. And Splash is an organization in the Seattle area that works to give clean water uh, to children uh, around the world. But again, these can be local, so you can have something very locally, like the different Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, etc., that are in, in different communities. You can have environmentally focused things like Greenpeace or the Sierra Club. You can have hunting groups that are looking to promote hunting and fishing. Anything is an NGO that's not officially governmentally uh, organized or represented. It can be a little confusing, again, though, because in sporting organizations, the key is that, that the organizations are in a country and not the organizations. The organization in a country and not the government, they belong to them. Now that gets a little confusing when you start talking about sports because sports and politics are linked. Whether they're supposed to be or not, they are linked. So here you have pictures, one of President George W. Bush uh, meeting, uh, not just meeting with, but marching with and sitting with the U.S. Winter Olympic team in 2002 at the Salt Lake City Olympics. And on the right you have President Bill Clinton at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics welcoming uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, gymnastics team. So they're, they're there, they're sort of floating around the edges, but the government does not belong to them. It doesn't mean they have nothing to do with them. Ideally, they'll be completely separate, but sometimes they're not. We'll look at that, some of those examples later. How does this play in with sports? Well, with um, NGOs, sporting NGOs, so we call differentiate a general NGO from a sporting NGO, uh, these are basically organizations that are dedicated to the promotion of sports. So first we're looking at sports-specific NGOs. In the uh, uh, one of the uh, readings you had in the last unit, they uh, were talking about Olympic eligibility, and they used that phrase IF for International Federation. So a federation, a sporting federation, is what they were talking about. They're a type of NGO, just sports-specific, just like you have uh, youth-specific NGOs like the Boy Scouts of America, the Girl Scouts of America. So in this case, the uh, sporting NGOs are listed here are, besides the IOC, International Olympic Committee, you've got basketball in the upper left, soccer in the upper right, track and field or athletics, rugby, swimming, and cricket. These are pretty big. And so what you'll see me use a lot in this class is the phrase sporting bingo. And bingo would just be a big international NGO that's tied to sports, a sporting bingo. So that's what I'm talking about here. And these are theoretically apolitical organizations, meaning they don't have anything to do with politics. Now that doesn't mean they don't have organizational politics. Right here at the University of Idaho, there's always something going on where um, there's an institutional politics where you're trying to position your, your department, your college, uh, your students, your employees better 
around campus and that doesn't stop us. So that, that, that we not, may, we're not allowed to engage in political activity, meaning we're not supposed to go out and campaign for anybody on our time, on university time, etc. But that doesn't stop there being organizational politics, right? Um, FIFA, the IOC, all the other sporting bingos have institutional politics. They say they are apolitical, meaning they don't engage in ex in the politics of external agencies or mess or muddle in anything like that. And these are a series of quotes that have come from uh, different people across uh, uh, the the last uh, several decades, where they're just sort of emphasizing that they don't care what the politics are. Now, this is this is manifestly inaccurate. It's very true that they say they're apolitical, but as you will see throughout the semester, they're tied. And there's so much going on here that it's hard to know where to start and what to say here, because we're just getting started in the course. We're going to have a, the next lecture is going to be about FIFA and the IOC specifically, and then we'll be talking about all kinds of examples as we go through the rest of the semester of different times where sports and politics are tied to these organizations, tied to sporting events, etc. There's so much here that right now we just want to say the statement, the idea is that they're apolitical, right? They're not involved in politics. The reality is they can't help but be involved in politics. And part of that's because of their uh, their sort of de facto, right? The difference between de, de jure means legally, de facto just means just as fact, it just happens. They're de facto backing of all kinds of regimes around the world when they choose them to host, when they ask them to be party to meetings, when they admit them to membership, those are political decisions. Uh, or they're at least decisions that have political ramifications. So there's a lot here, and we'll go through a lot of it. Just know, your thing to take away is they're apolitical. They say they're apolitical. It doesn't really work out that way in practice. But because they say they are apolitical, and they, they don't want any, any politics messing with their sport. It means they get into things like suspending a federation. So an IF, and we'll look at these charts again, remember, a local IF like the, the Taiwanese or the Guadalupan uh, IF was related to the next level, right? Uh, you have the, the local federation, the regional federation, the na international federation. The parent, like FIFA, can suspend federations if they think there's been politics meddling or the government meddling with their sport. So because they see they're apolitical, anything they see, whether it's uh, Nigeria here or Portugal, uh, and I hope you appreciate the eye candy, Ronaldo doing his thing. Uh, you know, the old days when uh, athletes got to take out, soccer players got to take out their shirts all the time. It was more fun for some people. It was just the same for others, but, you know, Ronaldo can't show this off all the time. He gets yellow cards. Anyway, or the Togo that you have uh, have had in the last decade instances where FIFA has suspended or threatened to suspend their local federation if the government doesn't stop what the FIFA calls meddling because they're supposed to be apolitical. Now, we'll look at these again when we talk at about governments and sports instead of sports and governments uh, here on, in Lecture 1-5. But just know that that's the idea that they're going to be pure and above politics. And the politics intercedes and they'll suspend you. Now, why does this matter? Well, in Unit 2, we'll talk a lot about sports space. And it might seem silly to say, oh, well, so what? FIFA suspended the Nigerian uh, Soccer Federation. Well, there's so many people that care about it, that in Nigeria that you can then have counter pressure back on the government to back off. So whatever the government's trying to do, positive or negative, if they mess with the federation and FIFA threatens them, then you, you can see the, feder the, the government back off, whether they're in the right or in the wrong, because they don't want to mess with their uh, very angry populace. Okay, so that's where we're going to stop for now on sporting bingos. But we're going to look at sports and its tie to other kinds of NGOs, issue-oriented NGOs. Now, there's all kinds of issue-oriented NGOs, right? We've looked a little bit, just briefly mentioned them about uh, uh, children's issues or uh, about environmental issues or hunting and, and sports, those sorts of sports activities. These here on this page, these five things, are all NGOs that use sport to achieve a particular end, uh, aim. So right to play is uses sport and play to help with youth empowerment and teach about HIV AIDS awareness and to teach about uh, the empowerment of girls and, uh, and, and women in certain countries. Athletes in Action, they're uh, um, a Christian-based organization that uses sports as a missionary tool. In other words, all of these are things that use the, the, the tool of sport and play to achieve a broader end. So there's a, it's, a, it's a very 
sort of nascent sort of field. It's something where uh, certainly over the last two decades there's a lot more places trying to do this. This is something we looked at here at the University of Idaho in something we call the Boris Symposium. We have this every year. I uh, have had it every year since 1948. It's organized by a committee of staff, faculty, and students housed in the Martin Institute but its own independent entity. It always looks at the causes of war, the conditions necessary for peace, and the international system. So what we did in 2013 was turn the symposium over to uh, a look at the way sports plays into this. So the question is, can sports save the world? And a, a, one of the very last things I have you read this semester will be an article by a fellow who came to the Boris Symposium named Alexander Wolf, who's very good at these issues. And he writes about the challenge of all of these organizations using sports to promote peace, to promote a common good, that they're using NGO, they're, they're issue-oriented entities, right? So they're not just about soccer or the promotion of soccer. Right, they're trying to do something else more broadly. So in this case, we looked at, for example, amputee soccer and the move to include people who have been victims of landmines and other sorts of horrific disasters during the civil wars that pervaded in West Africa in the 1990s. And we, we, so we looked at that. And so that's, that's an attempt to integrate. That's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to promote soccer. They're trying to integrate people who had been injured and they're trying to heal the wounds, broadly speaking, in the society that come from the Civil War. And they're using soccer as the tool to do it. Fields of Growth International is one that, that uses lacrosse to promote empowerment uh, and development. And, of course, Right to Play, Johan Olaf Koss, uh, he's the founder. He's a Norwegian speed skater. He founded Right to Play in the mid-1990s. And they're using generally play and sport to accomplish those other aims I had you look at. So this is the question, can sports save the world? So on the one hand, you have uh, sporting organizations which are very clearly engaged in political activity, who say they're apolitical, their focus is solely on their sport with perhaps some other aims besides. And then you have NGOs that are using sport to try and reach out and do some good that are also trying to be apolitical. They're also not things that governments belong to, but they're going to have to get involved in politics and then talking to leaders and doing some political things to compass their aims. So for the readings for this unit, we're going to focus uh, on the last kind of NGO because we're going to get into FIFA and the IOC in the next topic. So for this time, when you watch your bonus bit, it'll be uh, about a group called Soccer Without Borders and what they're trying to do. And they were here uh, as part of the Boris Symposium. And you'll read an article about Johann Olaf Koss at sort of the beginning of his political awakening about the power of what sports can accomplish. So here you have then uh, a variety of, of NGOs, right? These are all NGOs, sporting NGOs, the bingos, the big international NGO ones. Those would be like FIFA and the IAAF and the like. And then you have the NGOs using sports. So they're all non-governmental organizations. They're all political or apolitical in some way. That's sort of the trick is they'll want to say we're all here for the for sport, for the greater good of sport that's supposed to promote peace, it's supposed to promote understanding, but there's all kinds of stuff going on underneath. And we'll look at those throughout the semester. So uh what's up next is to read here and watch the bonus bit for for one three and then to get ready to to dive into FIFA and the International Olympic Committee next.